The dune scorpion here, a desert species, is what many people would consider to be a typical scorpion. But in many ways, it is not a typical scorpion. It might be typical for what you would consider an American scorpion, not typical for the rest of the world, say Africa or Asia. Scorpions belong to a fairly small order within the class Arachnida. There are only about 1,500 species so far described. All scorpions are nocturnal and the majority come from the tropics, not desert environments. They have adapted to a wide range of environmental conditions and they can now be found in all continents except Antarctica. The dune scorpion is one of the common, commonest scorpions perceived at night, at least in America. It is within the family Vajovidae. The scientific name is Smeringorus mesensis. It is native to the southwestern United States and the southern half of California, as well as Arizona. Species from northern Arizona are whitish, and the California examples are yellow. This yellow example, at least in comparison with this sand, is from California. It is very fast and relatively aggressive. If they're encountered in the field, it's likely that it would provoke more fear than curiosity. It is often the most dominant scorpion species in areas it inhabits, with densities as high as 1,300 to 4,000 individuals per hectare. They are so common that they are widely used to make glass paperweights, which can be found in many gift shops, particularly in desert areas of these states. Happily, this tradition seems to be dying out. Care for this scorpion is consistent with its desert home. Temperatures should stay within the range of 80 to 90 degrees Fahrenheit, with as little humidity as possible. Scorpions have no positive requirement for light. The best method for heating the tank is to use a heat mat. It is important to note that the temperature is too great. The scorpions will burrow into the substrate to avoid the heat. Of course, in their natural environment, heat would come from the sun, so they could easily escape the heat. Unfortunately, in captivity with a heat mat, this brings them closer to the heat mat and the heat, and the danger is that they will overheat and die. It is for this reason that the heat mat should not cover the entire base of the cage. An alternate approach that avoids the issue of scorpions burrowing towards the heat mat is to attach the heat source on the side of the tank rather than position it underneath. This allows the scorpion to burrow safely to cool itself by moving to the side furthest from the heat mat. The substrate in this case is not ideal because the sand is very loose. Using a sand mix with about 10% clay is ideal, although potting soil will also work as well. It's important to allow these scorpions to dig tunnels to their exact preference. Any other hide, say a surface hide, stresses them. The depth should be about three to five inches. They can survive in very dry conditions. However, within the burrow, the humidity is higher. It can be 20 or 30 percent humidity. They will drink misted droplets or standing water. A shallow water dish can be provided as long as it's not too big and would risk drowning the scorpion. Despite its ease of care, this species is one of the most studied scorpions in the world, but it's very difficult to breed in captivity. The dune scorpion lives in dune habitats and spends much of its time in burrows, hence the common name. They have a fairly wide foraging area, which increases greatly during their spawning time. It is estimated that they spend about 90% of their life in burrows. They emerge at around dusk, spending an average of four hours on the surface. 
Adults are active earlier in the evening, while the younger scorpions are active later in the evening. They become inactive in the winter. If you look at the types of dunes and environments they are found in Arizona, it's easy to see why it's difficult to properly recreate such conditions in captivity. Unlike the majority of arachnids, which are oviparous, scorpions seem to be universally viviparous. In other words, they give birth to live young, individually. The brood is carried about on the mother's back until they have undergone at least one molt. Before the first molt, about 12 days, scorpions cannot survive naturally without the mother, since they depend on her for protection and to regulate moisture levels. If they stay too long after the first molt, they risk being eaten. Mating takes place in August and September, usually on moonless nights, likely to avoid predation. The species has a long courtship dance, and during mating season, males increase the amount of time on the surface. They use vibrations to find mates, as receptive females can detect the vibrations of nearby males. Females also produce pheromones to attract mates, and the females initiate courtship. A female approaches a male and attacks him repeatedly by quickly approaching him and clubbing him with her tail. The stinger is tucked away. They both back away and the male judders by rocking back and forth rapidly with his legs. Juddering may be a way for the female to identify the male is one of the same species. The female attacks again and the sequence repeats again and again until the male grasps the female for the mating dance. He grabs her and leads her in search of a substrate to deposit the spermatophore, which the female takes from the ground. As soon as this is done, the male will likely attempt to get away. If the female is too quick and catches the male, she stings and cannibalizes him. On average, the litter size is about 33, but can be anywhere from between 9 to 53 individuals. They are produced once a year. The dune scorpion reaches maturity in 19 to 24 months. Dune scorpions have poor eyesight. I'm waving the pointer stick over the scorpion and it barely reacts. However, it will react to something that disturbs the substrate. As here, It's curious, perhaps wondering if it's a potential prey object, but it's also rearing its tail. Because this species is relatively delicate, it tends to use its stinger more than its pinchers in the front. The dune scorpion is a sit and wait predator and sits motionless at the mouth of its burrow waiting for prey, usually an insect, to move past. When it catches the prey, it stings it, waits, and then eats it later. This is unlike the forest scorpions that engage prey and tend not to use venom. The dune scorpion should be kept alone because it is very aggressive. It's solitary and it does not live in groups a very different suite of behaviors in this species. Here the scorpion is eating a worm. As is clear, it's using its tail primarily, and it's simply restraining the worm using its pinchers. It can take quite a long time for this species to feed because it has to wait for its prey to stop moving.
Now that the mealworm has expired, the scorpion is now eating its prey. As you can see, it's using its pinchers in the front of its body to carefully eat the mealworm. It looks very delicate. Dune scorpions are particularly feared because they find an easy home in shoes, particularly shoes that are left outside overnight. Because dune scorpions are rovers, searching for prey in the evening, they can easily get in a shoe and with the break of dawn, they will find the shoe a comfortable hiding place. The easiest way to deal with a scorpion in a shoe is to give them a good shake in the morning. The next species to consider is the aptly named emperor scorpion, which is very popular with scorpion keepers. But before we go into the mechanics of the species, we can go a little bit into the folklore to try to understand why is it people are afraid of scorpions. As a well-worn story goes, and I'll summarize, a scorpion asks a frog to carry it across a river. The frog hesitates, afraid of being stung by the scorpion. But the scorpion argues that if it did that, they would both drown. The frog considers this argument sensible and agrees to transport the scorpion across the river. The scorpion climbs onto the frog's back and the frog begins to swim. But midway across the river, the scorpion stings the frog, dooming them both to drown. The dying frog asks the scorpion why it stung, to which the scorpion replies, I couldn't help it, it's in my nature. The moral of the story is that like the scorpion, vicious people cannot help hurting others even if it dooms them. So it says something about people, and it also says something about how normal people, perhaps not scorpion keepers, view the natural world, particularly scorpions. They're unpredictable. They can sting viciously. That's not really true with the emperor scorpion. Here I'm bothering this individual, but he doesn't seem to be particularly interested in striking me. I can even touch the claws and it will try to remove the stick, but again is not striking. I'll touch the body of the scorpion outside of a quick backup, not particularly bothered. Very, very different behavior than the dune scorpion. But there might be some reasons for this. The emperor scorpion, scientific name Pendinus imperator, is one of the largest species of scorpion in the world. Adults average about nine inches in length. However, some species of forest scorpions are fairly similar to the emperor scorpion in size, so that if you see an emperor scorpion displayed, it could be another forest species. Emperor scorpions are typically found in hot and humid forests. Many imported for the pet trade are from Ghana and Togo. They're often used in movies because of their spectacular appearance. They reside in burrows and prefer to live under leaf litter, forest debris, stream banks, and also particularly in the mounds of termites, which are their main prey. Emperor scorpions will burrow through termite mounds up to six feet deep in order to hunt their prey. Juveniles rely on their venomous sting to paralyze prey, while adults tend to use their large claws to tear prey apart. Emperor scorpions breed throughout the year. After a gestation period of on average nine months, females give birth to 10 to 12 young. Emperor scorpions reach sexual maturity by about four years of age. The sting is frequently described as being like that of a bee. 
However, it is worth remembering that some people develop serious allergic reactions to bee stings. For this reason, although some people like holding their scorpions, I don't. It's also clear that it stresses the animals. They're not really used to being held like a cute fuzzy pet. Despite their fierce appearance, emperor scorpions are rather timid by nature, which makes them popular as pets. They are nocturnal and are rarely active before nightfall. This could be one reason why the emperor scorpion is a bit subdued in the daylight. It could be dazzled by the light. When threatened, they usually flee rather than fight, but if cornered in a small space, they turn aggressive and go into a defensive posture with their stinger ready. If we demonstrate that again, we can see that the stinger does indeed look ready. I'll even touch the stinger, but no, it doesn't strike. It is so docile that they are considered social animals and they can live in large colonies. A preferred substrate is not sand. This is only to give greater contrast between the dark animal and the background. A deep layer of peat-free compost is good, maybe several inches deep, and this can be covered with orchid bark. The top of the substrate should be sprayed with water every day, but never to the degree where it becomes wet and can risk drowning the animal. Care should be taken that the substrate does not become moldy or covered in fungus. In this case, more air should be let into the terrarium. Emperor scorpions are listed in Appendix 2 by CITES. Species listed in Appendix 2 are not threatened, but their trade is limited to prevent endangerment by human exploitation, in this case, primarily for the pet trade. It should be noted that there are many, many true emperor scorpions that are available captive bred. These are preferred for obvious reasons, but in this case, their future looks very bright. Next, I'd like to discuss a little bit about fossil scorpions. Scorpion remains have been found in Silurian and Devonian deposits, coal deposits from the Carboniferous period, and in amber. The oldest known scorpions lived around 430 million years ago in the Silurian period. This period was 443.8 million years ago to the beginning of the Devonian period, 419.2 million years ago. A significant evolutionary milestone during the Silurian was the diversification of jawed fish and the radiation of bony fish. Multicellular life also began to appear on land in the form of small bryophyte-like and vascular plants. And terrestrial arthropods are first found on land during the Silurian. However, terrestrial life would not greatly diversify until the Devonian. In contrast, to give some idea of scale, the Mesozoic or middle life era, dinosaurs and other monstrous beasts roamed the earth at this time. The period which spans from about 252 to 66 million years ago was also known as the age of reptiles or the age of dinosaurs. By the age of dinosaurs, scorpions were already ancient. The once believed to have lived on the bottom of shallow tropical seas, early scorpions are now believed to have been terrestrial. And there have been several very important discoveries about early scorpions within the last several years. These first scorpions were believed to have had gills instead of the present form's book lungs, though this has subsequently been challenged. The oldest Gondwanan scorpions, Gondwana scorpio, comprise the earliest known terrestrial animals from Gondwana. Gondwana was the supercontinent that existed 
from the Neoproterozoic about 550 million years ago until the Jurassic about 180 million years ago. Gondwana Scorpio lived about 360 million years ago in the Devonian. Its fossil remains clearly show pinchers and sting and were discovered in rocks of the Wittenberg group near Grahamstown in South Africa. A lot more information about this find is available online. At present, this scorpion is the oldest known land-dwelling animal from Gondwana. Ancestral scorpions had compound eyes, but as they adapted to a nocturnal lifestyle, they became simplified. Perhaps with increasing pressure from other animals, scorpions found a niche at night. The Eurypterids, an example is here, are commonly called sea scorpions. They were aquatic creatures that lived during the Paleozoic era, 541 to roughly 251 million years ago. They share several physical traits with scorpions and may be closely related to them. As is clear comparing the live scorpion here with the two Eurypterids here, there is a tail with a stinger, there are appendages, robust appendages here, and this partial example shows another robust appendage. Various species of Eurypterids could grow to be anywhere from the size of a modern scorpion to the enormous size of 2.5 meters in length. This is about 8.2 feet. They lived in Laurasia, the more northern of two supercontinents, the other being Gondwana. Both of these continents form part of the Pangaea supercontinent around 355 to 175 million years ago. Laurasia would later become North America, Europe, and the western part of Asia. A Eurypterid is the New York state fossil, like this one. However, they exhibit anatomical differences, marking them off as a distinct group from their Carboniferous and recent relatives. Despite this, they still have the common name that refers to their overall form like a scorpion. However, for Eurypterids, their legs were short, thick, and tapering and seemed to have ended in a single strong claw. Here's a swimming appendage here. Legs on many examples are harder to find. It appears they were well adapted for maintaining a secure hold upon rocks or seaweed against the lash of waves, like the legs of a shore crab. Cladistic analysis has supported the idea that the Eurypterids are a distinct group from the scorpions, despite their overall similarity in form, or they look somewhat similar, what looks like isn't necessarily what is. They're perhaps cousins and not closer relatives. The take home message is that Eurypterids are not crustaceans. The Eurypterid order belongs to the Chelicerata superclass. This class includes horseshoe crabs, scorpions, and arachnids. Exploring the natural world with UV light is now easier than ever before because there are small handheld LED flashlights that produce UV. They can be used for scanning the ground for scorpions and seeing what else fluoresces. The tobacco hornworm larva does not fluoresce, but its waste products do. The whip scorpion, which is a cousin of the scorpion, does not fluoresce under black light. In contrast to other species of invertebrate, scorpions are very easy to study at night. They fluoresce brightly under ultraviolet light, as this emperor scorpion does. 
Chemically speaking, no one is exactly sure what causes scorpions to glow. When a scorpion is preserved in alcohol, the alcohol itself fluoresces. Chemicals that make a scorpion so party ready are in the outer layer or cuticle of its exoskeleton, called the hyaline layer. Scorpions molt their exoskeleton every so often in order to grow. And until the outer shell has entirely hardened, the hyaline layer doesn't fluoresce under UV light. There are several theories that suggest why scorpions fluoresce. Scorpion fluorescence might help them find each other in the dark. It might protect them from sunlight, like sunscreen does to humans. It might also confuse their prey. It's also possible that the glow under UV light is a signal for them to avoid light. In nature, they want to find the darkest place to hide during the day, and they quickly disappear at the break of dawn. Although they are an ancient and successful species, they are small enough to be a meal for many predators. Here is a fossil Eurypterid and a dune scorpion in evening light. Amazingly, even after hundreds of millions of years, the fossil Eurypterid faintly glows, but not as much as the living scorpion. 